All right. Good afternoon, everybody. So today's lecture is on uh, implementing the method called equals. All right, so we've got several classes so far. We've got a point class, we've got a counter class, we have a stopwatch class. Um, so currently, we have some constructors and some simple methods in the classes. We haven't changed or we haven't implemented equals yet uh, for, our, uh, for our classes. So every class in Java extends this class called object. So I guess it's worth quickly looking at this class right now. If you look at the documentation for the object class, uh, so it, first of all, it's in java.lang, which tells you that it's one of the fundamental classes to the Java language. Uh, the description for the class doesn't say very much, but what it says is important. It says that class object is the root of the class hierarchy. So in Java, that just means that everything is a big O object uh, if it's not primitive. Every class has object as a superclass. All objects, including arrays, implement the methods of this class. So if you go and look at the methods of the class, you'll see there's a method called clone, there's one called equals, and there's a few others. We're mostly interested in equals, this one called hash code, and this one called toString. The other methods in the class uh, generally aren't of interest to us in this course. Uh, they won't be of interest to you until you take a course where you learn about uh, multi-threading. Um, which wouldn't happen until at the earliest third year. Um, today we want to look at equals. So if you go and look at the equals method, uh, you end up with a rather long description of the method. Right? We're not going to take, uh, we're not going to look at this in detail right now. Um, but if you look at it very quickly, you'll see that there are some terms here, right? It has to be reflective, it's supposed to be symmetric, it's supposed to be transitive. These all seem like mathematical terms, and they are. Um, and there's a few other things, too, that we'll talk about as we move along. I guess one other important thing here is the following. Uh, here it is. Right? So it tells you this method returns true if and only if x and y refer to the same object. Right? Uh, in other words, um, it's saying that the method behaves the exact same as if you had written x equals equals y. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. Okay, so if you don't over, uh, so our point two class hasn't implemented equals yet, but you are allowed to use it still because we get the implementation from object. So here we've got a point P. It's the point one, two, right? If you ask if does P equal P, uh, and if you think about this for a second, you should think that, well, it had better be true, right? It's, it's the same object after all, right? So it turns out this is in fact true. If you write, point P2 equals P, and then ask is P2 equal to P, or is P equal to P2, you also get true, right? But all that's, uh, that's, that should be um, obvious too, because P2 is the same object as P, right? You haven't made a new object yet. So it, they're still the same object. But if you go ahead and make a new object whose coordinates are also 1, 2, and ask is this new object equal to P, uh, the answer will be false. Right? So even though these two points have the same coordinates, as far as equals is concerned, they're not equal. Right? If you look at uh, what's happening in memory, you end up with the following picture here. So the first point, uh, I guess P, right, is that object right there. So it's the point two object uh, at memory at address 600. When you write P2 equals P, all you're doing is making a variable p2 that stores the same value as p. Right? So when you write something equals something in Java, all that literally happens is you copy the value from here into the new variable here. Right? And so that says p2 and p both refer to the object at address 600. And so there's only, at this point, there's only one point object in memory. It's not until you write new point two again that you get a second point object in memory whose coordinates also happen to be one and two, right? So that's the, uh, that's the object that, uh, that P3 refers to, right? So you have three variables here, but there's actually only two point two objects. P and P2 both refer to the first point, and then P3 refers to the second point, right? Now notice that these two points, they have equal, oh, sorry, their states are equal, right? So in other words, their coordinates are the same, 
but they're actually different objects. So the version of uh, equals that you get from object checks if two references refer to the same object. Right? So x equals y is true if and only if x and y are references to the same object, which is exactly the same as if you had written x equals equals y. Right? So when you, write, uh, when you use the equals equals operator in Java, it just checks what value is stored here and what value is stored here. If they're the same, it returns true, and if they're not, it returns false. Right? So this works for primitive values as well. Right? If you had x and y that were two ints and they were both one and one, uh, then one equals one is true, um, and, it, and the equals equals returns true. Right? So equals equals just looks at the value that's stored in the variable. We want equals to look at the state of the two objects. So most value type classes, like points, should support what's called logical equality. Uh, the version of equals that you get from object is uh, uh, the equality of identity. Right? Are the two objects the same? What you want is logical equality. So are, do two objects have the same state? Right? Uh, so we want two points to be equal if their x and y coordinates both have the same values. So if you went back to the early days of Java, so when the language first started to become popular in the mid-90s, uh, if you were to go and pick up two different textbooks and you were to look to see how, you should, how should you implement equals, you would probably get two different answers. Uh, Angelica Langer, she's a Java consultant, among other things. Uh, she has this to say about that. Uh, so one would expect that overriding equals, since it is a fairly common task, should be a piece of cake. The reality is far from that. Uh, there is an amazing amount of disagreement in the Java community regarding the correct implementation of equals. So that's no longer true. Um, if you look in any decent textbook nowadays, uh, it'll show you one of two different ways to implement equals. Uh, and you implement equals in the way that's uh, appropriate for the class that you're implementing. So I'll explain what that means um, a little bit later. There's effectively, there's basically two different ways to implement equals. There is a third, but no one uses the third because it's very complicated. Um, and so we might get to the second version today. Uh, so for right now, what we're about to do may not produce the exact result that you want, but it satisfies, uh, the, docu it satisfies the contract for equals that we saw in the object class. Uh, it's what most textbooks do. Um, nowadays. Oops, sorry. All right, so this is what we want to happen for equals. We want an object to be equal to itself, right? So x equals x should be true. We want an object to be never equal to null, right? So x equals null is always false. Furthermore, if you pass in null to equals, it should never cause an exception to happen. Uh, and equals in general should never throw an exception. Uh, for today, we're going to say that only objects of the exact same type can be equal. So you can have two points that are equal, but you can't have a point equal to, uh, be equal to a string, or vice versa. And finally, uh, we want instances or objects with the same state to be equal. Right? So two points with the same coordinates should be equal. So step one. An instance is always equal to itself simply means that x equals x should be true. Uh, x equals y should also be true if x and y are references to the same object. Uh, and you can check if two, references are, uh, if two references refer to the same object using equals equals. So step one of our equals method is the following. Now remember, this is a non-static method, right? So you, when you call the method, you're going to do something like, sorry, you're going to end up writing something like x equals y is true. Or sorry, x dot equals y. Right? Now remember inside the method, right, x is this, right, the y is obj. Right? So just keep that in mind as we're walking through the method. Right? So step one, I want to test are x and y the same object. Right, so x is this, y is obj. So if this equals equals obj is true, then I know that the uh, two references re are referring to the same object. At which point I can simply return true, 
right? Because an object is equal to itself. Technically, you don't need this if statement, um, but it's cheap to check, right? All you have to do is one equality test right there. Uh, so it's easy to do, it's inexpensive to test for, and it lets you immediately return true uh, from the method. So you can skip all of the other more expensive stuff that we're about to do. Okay, so that's requirement number one. So that's nice and easy to implement. Requirement number two, an instance is never equal to null. Right? So in other words, x equals null is always false, never throws an exception. <coughs> this is also easy to test for. So remember inside the method, um, that thing there is obj. So I just want to test, is obj null? The way you test a reference, uh, the way you test for a reference being equal to null is you use equals equals. Right? So if obj is null, then we can immediately return false. Right? And that satisfies requirement number two. Now if you don't put this test in, then the next step causes a null pointer exception, which equals is never supposed to do. So this if statement has to be here. Right? The first one doesn't. Uh, but that one right there must be here, otherwise the next step uh, um, produces an error when you call equals with null. Okay, step three, instances with the exact same type can be equal. Uh, now, for, in order to test for this, we somehow have to be able to get the type of the objects, right? So I need to be able to get the type of this and I need to be able to get the type of obj. We don't know how to do that yet. Um, so, step three is where the two different versions of equals differ. Right? So the way we're going to do it today is to use this method called getClass, which is also in the object class. Let's see if I can track it down quick. Okay, so getClass returns the runtime class of this object. Right? So actually what it returns is a type uh, it returns an object whose type is big C class, right? Uh, you can see here the return type is actually very strange. It's got, it looks like it's a generic type and it's got this question mark in it. Um, just ignore that for now, right? All that we care about is that it returns some object uh, whose type is big C class, right? The object that it returns represents the type of the object that you use to call the method, right? So if you call get class with a point two object, you get back some class object that represents the point to class, right? If you were to call get class with a string, you get back some class object that represents a string, uh, the class string. Uh, this method promises, where is it? Oh, it doesn't actually say it here. Um, that's strange that it doesn't say that here. It is the object, is the object. Oh, okay, it is the object. So it, it's very vague in how it's documented. The object that's returned by this method is always the same object if you call it, uh, so sorry, it doesn't matter what type of, it doesn't matter which string object you use to call the method, the object that you get back is always the same class object, right? So for any string, you get back the same class object. For any point two object, you get back the same class object. For any my class object, you get back the same uh, class object. So in other words, there's only one class object for every, uh, for every uh, type in the language. Um, that's the way this method actually works. All right, so it looks like all you have to do is call get class, and then we can compare the objects that are returned by this method. All right, so if this get class, so that returns some object, right, that represents the type of this, obj get class returns some object that returns the type of obj, right? If they are different objects, then we know that the types of the two things are different, right? So this is a different type than obj. And so for today, we're gonna return false if that's the case. So that's requirement number three. So all we're left with now is requirement number four which is instances with the same state are equal. Right. Okay, so usually when you implement equals, you're going to compare the field, all the fields of your objects 
with all the fields of the other object. For the point two class, we're going to compare the x and y coordinates with the x and y coordinates of the other object. Uh, you don't always do that, right? So you don't always compare all the fields, uh, but normally, you can, uh, most of the time, you can end up comparing all of the fields. But we have a problem at this point, right? So the problem is the way the method is written, right? OBJ, its type is big O object, right? And big O object, we don't know what fields big O object has. Right? As far as the compiler is concerned, right, OBJ is always a big O object. So at this point here, right, I know that the class of OBJ is the same as the class of this. We're inside the point two class, so I know that OBJ is a point two object. Right? So the implementer knows OBJ has an X and a Y coordinate, but the compiler, all it knows is that OBJ is a big O object. So I can't get to the x and y coordinate of that thing right there. Right. So I can't get the fields of OBJ because it, the method declares OBJ to be a big O object. So we need a cast. In other words, we have to convince the compiler that OBJ is in fact a point two object. Right. So step four is always cast OBJ to whatever type or whatever class you're currently implementing uh, equals for. So we cast OBJ to a point two object and store the result in a variable called other. You can call this whatever you want. I always call it other. Right? Oops, sorry, that should just be point two, not simple point two. Okay, so now that I've convinced the compiler that other is in fact a point two object, I can go ahead and get the x and y coordinate from other. If you're missing this third check here, Right? So in other words, if you don't check if the two types are the same and you pass in something that's not a point two object, that cast right here fails. Right? You end up with a class cast exception here. Um, and you're not supposed to uh, throw an exception from inside equals. So this test here is necessary. Okay, so now I want to go in and I want to look at the x and y coordinates of other. I want to look at the x and y coordinates of this, and I want to compare, are they the same? Right. So it turns out there's a recipe for doing this. Right. So the recipe is as follows. If your fields have primitive type, and they're not floating point types, right? so if they're integer or boolean, just compare the fields using equals equals. Right. If your fields happen to be a floating point type, then what you want to do is you want to convert them from their floating point type to some kind of integer type. The way you're supposed to do it is to call this method float, float to int bits if you have a float, or double, double to long bits if you have a double. So what these two methods do is as follows. Right, so a float has 32 bits, an int has 32 bits. Right? So all this method does is it takes the bits of your float and reinterprets it as though it were an int. Similarly for double, what this method does is it takes your double value, reinterprets the bits as though they were a long value. Uh, so these basically safely convert a float to an int and a double to a long. Right? Once you have them um, as an integer value, you can compare them using equals equals. If you have arrays as your fields, then use arrays.equals uh, or arrays.deep equals if you have a multidimensional array. Um, and if your fields are reference types, then just use the equals method for your reference types uh, to compare them for equality. Okay, so why do we have to go through this nonsense when we have floating point fields? Uh, and the answer is, is because floating point arithmetic is weird. Right? So one of the weirdnesses is if you happen to have the value not a number, then not a number is never equal to not a number. Right? So the IEEE 7054 standard says not a number is equal to, if a value is equal to not a number, then it's equal to nothing, including itself, right? Uh, so that's a bit, uh, that's part of the standard, that's part of the IEEE standard, so we have to live with that. Now, if your object happens to have a field whose value is not a number, oh, sorry, right? And you have another object whose field also happens to be not a number, then you probably want them to be equal, 
The problem is if you use equals equals, that will never be the case. Right? So uh, we have to convert them to their integer representation. Right? Now because these two method, this method here just reinterprets the bits uh, as being a long value, then really all it's doing is comparing the bits of the two values. Right? So the bits for NAN are the same as the bits for NAN, so you get back true in this case. The other strange part of the, uh, so the other unusual part of floating point numbers is that there's a negative uh, and a positive zero. Right? So under the IEEE standard, negative zero is equal to positive zero. However, if you look at the bit pattern for negative zero, it's different than the bit pattern for positive zero. Right? So in other words, once you convert them to their integer representations and compare them, you get false. And this is the way that the standard library implements, um, this is the way that the standard library uh, defines equality for the type big D double. Uh, and so you want to be consistent with the way that the standard library does stuff, uh, does things. So to be consistent, convert, to, uh, convert your floating point values to their corresponding integer values, uh, and then compare the integer values. So for our point two class, what ends up happening is you take this x, convert it to its long value, take other x, convert it to its long value, and test if they're not equal. Right? If they're not equals, then you can return false because the x-coordinates are different. Right? Then do the same thing with the y-coordinates. If they're not equal, you return false. Finally, if you get to this step here, you know the following. Right? You know that the two objects are different objects you know that the object that was passed into the method is not null, you know that the two objects have the same type, and you know that the coordinates of the two points happen to be the same. So only at that point can you return true. Right. Uh, and you can kind of imagine that um, it took some time to figure out this is the way you should do things when you implement equals. Okay. So our version of equals compares the state of two points to determine equality, right? So it looks at the x and y coordinates. Uh, and so now when you call, use equals um, with 2.2 objects, uh, they will compare using their coordinates and not their uh, identity. Right? So if I make a point P whose coordinates is minus 1 and 1.5, and I make a copy of that point right there, when you ask are they equal, the answer is true, right? So there are two different objects. They have the same state, so now they're equal. Okay, so let's quickly f go back to the documentation for equals. Right. So the formal documentation for equals says that uh, equals should be reflexive, it should be symmetric, it should be transitive, consistent, and uh, x equals null should never return false. Right. So it should be all of these things here. Um, the terms reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, uh, these are simply the mathematical terms that are used to formalize the contract for the method. Right? But we, our implementation actually does all of these things for us. Right? So what does reflexivity mean? It simply means that x equals x is true. Right? So uh, it, um, an object is equal to itself. But that was step one of our method. Right? Symmetry means that x equals y, if x equals y is true, then y equals x is also true. Right, so in other words, it doesn't matter what order the two, the two variables appear in. Right? As long as y is not null, right, x equals y should return the same value as y equals x. Right? Or in other words, two objects must agree on whether or not they're equal. So transitivity is just the relationship between three objects. Right? So in other words, uh, three objects have to agree on whether or not they're equal. Right? So if x and y are equal, and y, or z, y and z are equal, then it must be the case that x and z are also equal. Consistency just means that equals can't be random. Right? So if you have two objects uh, and you compare them with equals, if you never change the state of the two objects, equals always returns the same value. And then finally, the non-nullity requirement means that x equals null is always false, never throws an exception. Right? And if you walk through the implementation of equals that we just did, you can easily show that all, of these, uh, all five of these requirements are met.
Okay, so let's do the same thing for counter. Right. So remember, counter just has one field. Its, its type is an int, and it's called value. Right. So if I want to compare if two counters are equal, two counters are equal if they have the same value. Right. Step one, right. test if the two objects are the same object. If they are, return true. Right. Step two, test if the incoming object is null. If it is, we have to return false. Right. Step three, compare the two classes of the objects. Right. If they're different, return false. Step four, cast. Right. Step five, compare the fields. Right. Now in this case, our field is primitive, so we can just use equals equals. Right. So I can just return right, this value equals equals other value. Right. If the values are different, we'll get false. If the values are the same, we get true. Okay, so um, on a quiz or on an, on an exam, you kind of have to memorize these steps. Right? They're not difficult to memorize, but you kind of have to commit them to, yes? Are you able to pass null into like this? No. No, no. so it doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. right. So remember, null means no object, right? So you can't have no object and call, equal, and call a method with it. Uh, unless the method is static, in which case it works. But that's, equals is not static. Right. Uh, I guess there's something else I have to mention is the method equals method always looks like this, right? It's always public boolean equals big O object, right? If you change the big O object to something else, it's not equals anymore. It's something else. It's an overridden version of equals. If you change the name to something else, it's not equals anymore, right? Uh, the return type has to be boolean and it has to be public. So you can't reduce the visibility of the method. Um, if you try to make this private or something, the compiler will complain. If you change the return type, the compiler will complain. If you change the parameter type, the compiler won't complain, but it's not equals anymore, right? You're, over, uh, you're overloading the equals method. So you're adding a second equals method to the class. You're not replacing this version of equals. Sorry, question over here? Yeah, I was just wondering, is the type necessary? Yes. Yeah. That right here? Yeah. Yes. You can't get, you can't write obj.value here because obj is a big O object. Oh, so the yeah. 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 Um, is, is, when you showed the example of point two, you had like two different types for the y and x. Yeah. So we should, is there a way of doing that? Uh, say you had like five different um, parts for like a yeah. object or like five objects. Yeah. Um, is there a way of doing that without writing five if statements? You can use, uh, I think you can use, where to go? Is it, oh, sorry. Java eight big O. I don't know where they put this class. Uh, it's in util. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, can you do uh, without writing five different if statements? Let's see. Um, I guess the short answer is no. Um, you could combine them all, right? You could write the one if statement and use and to combine everything. No, there's no way you can, oh, so I shouldn't say there's no way you can do it. Um, what happens if you try to use... Can you just write a loop to check over them? Yeah. So they, the long answer is yes, but I would have to tell you how to do reflection in Java. So there is a way to get to the fields of an, of a, of an object. Um, it's, not, it's a little clunky, but there is a way to do it. Yeah. Uh, so then you could write a loop over the fields. Yeah. OK, oh, well, I was going to tell you. So uh, in like a classroom, like in, in a course like this, where you're gonna get questions asked on the quiz or on an exam, you kind of have to commit this to memory. But in practice, you can ask your IDE to do this for you. Uh, you can ask your IDE to do this for you. Okay, so this is the point two class uh, from the course notes. I just have to delete some stuff because I did this uh, this morning. All right, so we're inside the point two class. We don't have an equals method yet, right? I wanna go ahead and implement equals. You could spend the next five minutes typing all that in, assuming you committed it to memory, but any decent IDE will generate equals for you. 
So in Eclipse, if you go to the source menu, and then you go to generate hash code and equals. Now you can't generate these two methods separately. You always generate these together inside an IDE. Right? So here, it'll ask you which fields do you want to compare for equality. Right? So for the point two class, I want to compare X and Y. You click generate, and it spits out equals. Right? So it automatically implements it for you. Right? And it implements it the exact same way I just showed you. Right? Check if the two objects are the same object. Check if OBJ is null. Check if the two objects have the same type. Do your cast. Uh, and now here, convert your floating point field to an integer field and do the comparison that way. Yep? Does it just mean that this has class? No. So, uh, I think, uh, so it doesn't insert this for you automatically. So Eclipse, um, if it accesses a field, or you can see here it doesn't put this in front of the field either, right? So if it accesses a field or calls a method uh, using this, uh, it doesn't put the this in by default. I think you can configure it to put it in all the time. Um, but by default, it doesn't put it in. Right? No, you don't have to write it. it it's the same thing. I don't actually know if what most Java programmers do in practice. I think it depends on the styling, uh, the coding conventions for the place they're working at. Um, I always put it in, uh, just to emphasize that you're using this object to call the method. Okay. Uh, 102. All right. So I guess we can look at the second version of equals. Okay, the second version of equals, step three changes. So this is equals using this method, uh, sorry, this operator called instance of. So that version of equals I just showed you, it's perfectly fine um, if the class is never used as part of what's called an inheritance hierarchy. Right now, in a week or so, we're gonna start to talk about inheritance. Um, and that's where you have to consider which version of equals do you want. Uh, so the version of equals I'm about to show you now, I don't remember what I did with the notebooks, if I changed it to get class or not. Uh, but anyway, the notebooks also show you how to implement it using uh, this particular method. Okay, so it's all the same requirements, right? Because we're implementing the same method. The thing that changes here is step three, right? So in the version I just showed you, we said that only objects with the exact same type can be equal. Here we're gonna relax that restriction. We're gonna say that objects that have what are called compatible types can be equal. Okay, so everything is the same up to step three, right? So object should be equal to itself, right? Step two, never equal to null. Now, in this case, we're not gonna explicitly check for null because step three is gonna give, give that to us for free. Right. So unlike the previous lecture, we don't have to test step two explicitly. We're going to get that when we do the step three. Right. So step three, instead of using get class, we're going to use this operator called instance of. Right. So the way you use instance of is you take in some reference. Right. You write instance of. And then you put it, you, uh, the, on the right hand side, it's some type. Right. So some class type or some interface type. The result of instance of is true or false, right? So instance of returns true if that object here implements the interface that's on the right-hand side, right? So if you had a list, x, x instance of array list would be true, right? Instance of also returns true if that object has the exact same type as what's here. Right, so if P, instance of 0.2, right, so if P is a 0.2 object, then that'll return true. Right, so that's exactly the same as get class. Now instance of will also return true if this thing here, sorry, if this thing here is what's called a subclass of that thing there. Right, so we're gonna talk about subclassing in a couple of weeks. If that thing there is null, Instance of always returns false. It doesn't matter what's over here. 
Right? So if the reference is null, then you get false. So we get, the, we get our test for null here for free. So instead of if this get class not equals to other uh, obj get class, oh hey, that's completely wrong. Sorry, if well, that's embarrassing. If obj instance of there we go. Okay, so if the incoming object is not a point two object, right? Then we can return false, right? Furthermore, if obj is null. We automatic, uh, this, um, this thing here is automatically false, right? So not false is true, and we return false there. Everything else is the same. Right? So two instances with the same state are equal, so we have to do our cast, right? Apply the recipe, right? It's the exact same recipe every time, right? Now I'm just gonna compare the fields, and you're done. So the only change is right here. And so you've got two different versions of equals. Which one should you prefer using? So the answer is, uh, this is the one that the uh, Joshua Block recommends. So he's the architect of the Java language. Uh, most textbooks do the other version. Um, if you are working in an inheritance hierarchy, this is probably the version that you want to use. Right? Uh, but that doesn't make, won't make any sense to you um, for another couple of weeks. This version can also get you into, well, both versions get you into trouble. Um, but we'll explain that uh, when we talk about inheritance. Okay, so that's equals, right? So it's, it's easy to do. You just have to remember what the steps are, right? If you're working in an IDE, you don't even have to remember that. Just ask the IDE to generate it for you. But for the purposes of this course, you have to kind of commit this to memory, right? You have to remember that it's always public Boolean equals object. Right? Then you have to remember the four steps. Right? On a quiz, I don't really care if you do this double to long bit stuff or the float to long bit stuff. Right? Just compare them using equals equals or not equals, it's fine. Right? Um, but in a professional programming environment, you have to know, you have to be aware that this is something that you should be doing. Right? And that's all I want to say about equals. Anybody have any questions about uh, equals? Okay. Let's move on to the next method. So you may have noticed when I generated e, sorry when I generated equals for our point two class, Eclipse said it didn't ask me if I wanted to generate equals. It said, "Do you want to generate hash code and equals?" Right? So in other words, it will always generate both for you at the same time, and you don't have a choice. Right? And so that kind of tells you that these two things are related to one another, and they are. So if you decide that you want to change how equals behave, you also have to change the way that hash code behaves. Right? If you don't, right, then as soon as someone tries to use a hash set or a hash map in your class, uh, they'll suddenly find that the hash set or hash map no longer works properly. Right? OK, so so far in point two, we haven't even looked at this method called hash code. Right? So we haven't replaced how it works yet. So the version of hash code that we get is the version we get from big O object. Okay, so we've got a point two object. Its coordinates are one and minus two. And now I make a hash set. Same thing, uh, you'll get the same result if you make a hash map. Right. So I make a set. I add my point to the set. Right. And I ask the set, does it contain the point P that I just put in? Right. And the answer is true which is good, right? I just put P into the set after all. If you make another point Q that's equal to P and then ask the hash set, do you contain the point Q? It now returns false, right? Even though Q equals P is true, right? Uh, and so this is going to be confusing for whoever's using uh, your class in combination with a hashed container. Okay, so what's going on here? So suppose you have a list of points, right? So not a set, but a list, right? So how would you compute whether or not the list contains a particular point, right? So in other words, I want to write a method that tests does this list have a particular point, right? I'm pretty sure you can all do this, right? You would write a method, right? We're going to call it has point, right? We're going to pass in a reference to a point P, 
we're going to pass in a list of points. Right? We're going to return true if that list contains something equal to that point P. Right? So you just write a little loop right? for each point in points. Right? If that point equals P, then you found a point in the list that's equal to the point you're looking for. So you return true. Right? If you make it to the end of the loop, then you've looked at every point in the list and you haven't found a point that's equal to P. So you return false. Right? Okay, so that's called linear search or sequential search. If I double the length of the array, that doubles the amount of searching you need to do. Right? So if there's n elements in the list, then in the best case, right, the first element is the one you're looking for, so you call equals once. In the worst case, the element is not in the list, so you call equals n times. Right? And on average, the thing that you're looking for happens to be in the list. Right? So that's on average n over 2 calls to equals. Right? So the worst case and the average case are both big O of n. Okay, so the hash containers though, remember I told you hash set and hash map, their contains method runs in O1 time, right? A constant time. So how do they do that? All right, so both hash set and hash map, you can think of them as being something called a hash table. So a hash table, you can imagine, is just this giant array. Well, not, is it just an array, right? It has big N plus one buckets, right? Now each bucket, you can put more than one reference in each bucket, right? So it's like an array where you can put multiple things in each element. Right? So the way these things work, if you have an object A, and I want to put this into the hash table, right? then what the hash table does is it takes A, and it calls its hash code method. So hash code is defined in the object class. Right? Oh, sorry. The, the here we go. Right? It's defined in the big O object class. And it's right there. So hash code returns an int. Right? Effectively, what hash code does is it takes your object, right, your reference, and somehow converts it to an int value. Right? So in other words, it maps your object to an int of some kind, uh, somehow. OK, so what the hash table does is it calls hash code on your object A. Right? Hash code returns some int value. Right? And we don't care what int value it actually returns. Right? It should return a negative value. It could return 0. It could return some positive value. Right? Whatever value gets returned, the hash table takes that value and maps it to a value between 0 and n. So that's what that red arrow means. Right? The red arrow means the hash table takes the hash code, does something to it to make it fit in the range 0 through n. Right? Exactly how it does that, not important. So in this case, we get two. So what does the hash table do? It takes A and puts it into bucket number two. Right? So A goes into bucket number two. Right? If you have another object and you want to put that into the hash table, the hash table calls hash code on the object, gets back some int value, converts it to a value between zero and n. And in this case, we get zero. So B goes into bucket zero. Right. C goes into bucket N. D also goes into bucket N. Right. Okay, so I, oh. ideally, the distribution of elements in a hash table is uniform. Right. So in other words, each bucket holds approximately the same number of elements. Right. So how does contains work? Right. So contains works so contains on a list would have to look in each bucket, right? On a hash table, you don't do that, right? On a hash table, if I want to know, does it contain the object A, right? All you do is call hash code, right? Hash code returns some int. The hash table converts it to some value between 0 and n and goes and looks in that bucket, right? So we go and look into bucket 2, right? And we ask, well, is A equal to the thing in bucket two, 
The answer here happens to be yes, so it contains returns true. So what happens if we want to look for Z, right? So if we want to look for Z, the hash table calls hash code on object Z, does something to the return value, and it turns out this time it maps to bucket number N. So the hash table goes to bucket N and asks, is Z equal to C, right? The first element in the bucket. The answer is no. Right? So it now goes to the next element in the bucket. Is Z equal to D? The answer is no. There's no more elements in the bucket. So the answer is Z, uh, Z does not contain D. Uh, sorry, Z, uh, the hash table does not contain Z. So searching a hash table turns out to be much faster than doing linear search. If you double the number of elements in the hash table, then normally that doesn't increase the amount of search that's needed. Right? So in other words, uh, the hash table manages its buckets or manages the number of buckets it has so that there's always relatively, so it tries to make sure that there's always a um, roughly the same number of elements per bucket. Right? So if there are n elements in the hash table, right, in the best case, whatever bucket the hash table looks in is empty, or there's only one, or the first element in the bucket happens to be the one you're looking for. Right? So in that case, you get zero or one calls to equals. In the absolute worst case, uh, all n of your elements happen to be in the same bucket, right? So that ends up being n calls to equals. This should never happen in a well-designed hash table. Right? On average, right, so in a well-designed hash table, the, each, uh, the element in a bucket, sorry, each bucket has roughly the same number of elements, and the number of elements does not depend on, sorry, the number of elements per bucket does not depend on the total number of elements in the hash table. Uh, and so that leads to a small number of calls to equals, uh, which is uh, in O1 time. Right. How exactly these hash tables manage to do that is a uh, subject uh, for a different class. Did they tell you how these work in your data structures course? Yeah? OK. So yeah. So if they told you how these work, then this is how Java is uh, implementing hash set and hash map. Okay, if you don't override hash code, then you end up with the implementation from object. Right. Object hash code uses the memory address of the object to compute the hash code. So what does that mean? It means that um, if I make a point P, right, and put it into a hash set, and I make a point Q, and put it into that, uh, and ask does, that, does the hash set contain point Q, right? The answer is probably going to be false. Why? Because when the hash table calls hash code on Q, right, it's probably going to get a different value than when it calls hash code with P. Because P and Q refer to objects that have different memory addresses. Right? So P and Q refer to distinct objects. Therefore, their memory ad uh, locations must be different. Therefore, their hash codes are probably different, almost certainly different. Right? And therefore, the hash table looks in the wrong bucket. Right? And it doesn't, sorry, it doesn't find the point uh, that it's looking for, even though P equals Q is true. OK, so I guess we'll stop there, and we'll implement hash code in the next lecture. <laughs>